I'd like to introduce Stephanie Davis Harai <coughs> from Transgender Trends. <laughs> Stephanie is a communication skills expert, teacher, trainer, parent, coach, and author of the highly regarded book Communicating with Kids. She's an experienced speaker on parenting, feminism, and transgender children, and has made regular contributions to the House of Commons. She founded the organisation Transgender Trend in 2015, and has produced comprehensive guidance for supporting gender variant and trans-identified students in schools, for which she was shortlisted for the John Maddox Prize, a joint initiative of the charity Sense About Science, and the science journal Nature, in recognition of her work to promote sound science and evidence on a matter of public interest, facing difficulty or hostility in doing so. Thank you. Are you going to press the buttons for me? Thank you. Thanks for that lovely welcome. Um, yeah, so I set up transgender trend in 2015 because I'd seen over the preceding couple of years uh, increasing press and media coverage of so-called trans kids and all of this was totally uncritical and I noticed that there was no voice of challenge in the media and I knew that if I wanted to be that voice of challenge I needed to be an organisation and I needed to have a website. Um, it worked very quickly. I got into the media. The other reason I set up Transgender Trend was that I noticed in all these stories that parents who were worried um, searched online for help and all they found was propaganda from organisations such as Mermaids and Gendered Intelligence and Stonewall. And... Um, so these organisations would just tell them, your daughter is now your son and you must affirm him as a boy. Um, so I thought parents needed an alternative source of information that was based on facts and evidence and research because if my child was insisting on puberty blockers or a double mastectomy, as a parent, I would want to know all the evidence behind such drastic medical intervention. As a parent, I would take some convincing that a less intrusive pathway was not even worth trying. Um, I've been criticised for calling the organisation Transgender Trend. Next slide, please. Um, no, no, sorry, that one. <laughs> yeah. This is why, partly why, I call it a trend. Trend is a neutral word and it demonstrates what we see happening globally with referrals to gender identity clinics. I also called it transgender trend because parents told me that was the search term that they would put into Google when they were searching for some real information and facts about what was happening. And those are the parents I wanted to attract. I wanted them to find this website that had the um, real information and, and, and was, would be a resource for them. Um, so I'm un unapologetic about the name. I like to use clear language. Transgender Trend does exactly what it says on the tin. We're critically examining this unprecedented global trend of so-called transgender kids. Um, I produced the school's guidance here. And this, if you want to come and get a copy of this, I've got a few copies here. Um, because I saw that organisations such as All Sorts and Stonewall and Intercom Trust and transgender lobby groups were producing guidance and I thought well if they can I can too but I also know that if you are going to challenge your child's school on their transgender policies you need to have an alternative you need to take something into them and say have a look at this this is different and I think this is better so that's the reason I produced that. We've also produced a document uh, uh, on safeguarding concerns which looks at the organisations which are actually promoted by the Department for Education and how they undermine safeguarding policies and statutory safeguarding advice for schools from the Department for Education, even though the DfE does promote these groups. And as mentioned by Safe Schools, the Children's Rights Impact Assessment on the All Sorts 
toolkit. This will apply to every other toolkit from every local authority across the country because almost all toolkits are based on the all sorts toolkit, except in Cornwall where they have the Intercom Trust. Um, you can get these from me afterwards, except this one. This, this is a display copy only because we're running out. Um, so you can't have that, but you can have a look at it. Um, the reaction I got, I published this, the schools pack in February 2018. In, February, in 2000, November 2017, I'd met up with the Equality and Human Rights Commission because I'd asked them to be a stakeholder in their national schools guidance. I can't talk about the EHRC uh, national schools guidance, which should be published this month, because as a stakeholder, I'm bound by confidentiality. Um, I can, however, talk about the leaked Scottish guidance, so I might refer to that later. Um, but I deliberately actually worked very hard and rushed out the um, Transgender Trend Schools pack because at that time, the EHRC schools guidance was due to be published in March of that year. So I brought out the Transgender Trend Schools guidance just to pick them to the post and give them, to some, some, give them something to think about. And I have to thank Stonewall for doing a sterling job on really, really promoting the Transgender Trend <laughs> Schools pack. Um, <laughs> To all, to all local authorities telling them not to use it. They did a fantastic, fantastic job for me there. Um, I actually published it in half term. I was thinking this is not a good time. You know, parents are on holiday. It's, it's, it's going to go sort of by unnoticed. And after a few days, suddenly Twitter exploded. And it hasn't really stopped since. So I did something really against the rules there, of which I'm very proud. Um, I was not allowed to write school's guidance, even though these other lobby groups were. Um, so let's, I'm going to talk um, today about that term, transgender kids, and how we have changed our language in the way that we refer to children who have gender dysphoria. The term transgender, by definition, establishes gender conformity as the rule. It teaches children that if you transgress the gender rules for your sex, you must go over to the other side and identify yourself as the opposite sex. Even if your gender transgression is not that extreme, you can no longer claim to be a boy or a girl. You must re redefine yourself as non-binary, neither boy nor girl or a mixture of both. And it's suggested to children who transgress the gender rules for their sex that the fault in them is so grave that medical intervention is necessary to correct it. If you are a girl who has interests typically or traditionally associated with boys, then you are a boy. This is your true, authentic self, and this can only be expressed through a lifetime as a medical patient. So who would teach children such a regressive, misogynistic, and harmful way of understanding themselves? Well, now schools and the Department for Education and local authorities. So this is no marginalised sector of society lobbying to get their voices heard. This is policy capture at the highest level um, by organisations and charities such as Stonewall, Mermaids, Gendered Intelligence, Gyres, all sorts, and Educate and Celebrate. And these are not child support organisations in any neutral sense but activists who are at the forefront of shaping public policy and government legislation for the whole of society. They are political organisations. They are heavily funded by government departments and lottery grants and charities such as Children in Need. And between them, they advise and provide training for the police, the Home Office, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, the Crown Prosecution Service, They've done Girl Guiding UK, the Football Association, Sports England, the Prison and Probation Service. I could go on and on. But along with schools, the NHS, the NSP NSPCC, and social services, and of course the media. 
So the political campaign of transgender activists has two key goals. One is to establish gender identity as the distinction between men and women in society and in law. And, to, and the other one is to establish affirmation and social transition as the only legitimate approach towards children with gender dysphoria. And these two campaign go goals are inex inextricably linked because if you're saying that gender identity is innate, then you have to say children are born with it. And it's no secret that these self-appointed experts who are influencing policies on children, such as Jaya's, and um, share the political aims of the, the most extreme activists that we see on Twitter um, to change the definition of man and woman in law. I just want to pause here and show how I'm qualified to talk about this issue. The next slide. I am actually, because I get accused a lot about you've got no right to talk about trans kids, you don't work with trans kids, uh, as if trans kids were some magical being that are different to every other child. Um, I'm actually qualified um, through the Gires e-learning gender variant children and trans adolescence resource. I, I, I passed in... Um, <laughs> 2018 and, and I have the same qualification to talk about trans kids as GP Helen, Dr. Helen Webberley. <laughs> this is, so Gires, um, this, was, this resource was actually taken down from the um, Royal College of General Practitioners after some complaints by some great doctors um, who, who questioned the advice given in this e-learning resource. This wonderful certificate that I own, and I have framed at home, um, <laughs> I had to answer every question wrong. You know, I had to say the opposite of what was the sensible approach towards any child. So, Gires. Um, Gires say this. Gires supports the application of the term sex to biological factors and gender to psychosocial and cultural factors. So, so far, so good. Hence, male, female are terms for describing sex, but man, woman, or any variations between or outside these so psychosocial categories are terms for describing gender identity. Now, that is, a ca that is the campaign goal of activists, to establish men and women as gender identities and not as sexes. This was from their annual report 2017. So the denial of biological sex is no hidden ideological agenda. It's out there, we know it. The All Sorts School Toolkit, which is promoted on the Mermaids website, it's promoted by the Tavistock JIDs, it's promoted by the NEU, gives this advice on the teaching of sex education. In labelling the genitals, make it clear that most, rather than all boys, have a penis and testicles. And most, rather than all girls, have a vulva and vagina. Teachers are also openly advised to encourage a boy who identifies as a girl to believe that he was literally born female. And I quote from their guidance, some trans pupils and students will need support in developing scripts and responses to questions they may be asked about their transition. This may include phrases such as, I have always been a boy or girl. According to Gires, our gender identity is our psychological sense of Fitting into social categories, um, that's my italics there, typically of man or woman, and that's from their e-learning resource. So Giles claims that it is this feeling about our social position which defines us as boys and girls or men or women, and yet also claims that this feeling is determined pre-socially existing before birth. That's their... Um, there. Um, really clever, self-aware fetuses there we're looking at. Um, 
Uh, so gendered intelligence also concurs with Jaya's in the innate gender identity model and yet explicitly describes gender as an outside influence, referring to the social shaping of a boy or girl. So gendered intelligence say that gender means the concepts, roles or attributes that are associated with sex. Gender refers to the social shaping of an individual as being a, boy, a, a girl or a boy, man or woman, and is represented through behaviour. For example, the behaviour of being aggressive or passive. Gender is often understood as cultural, and yet it exists pre-socially in the womb. So just a quick look at how the transgender resources in schools teach this message to the youngest children from early, early years onwards. Um, this is the Jaya's um, teaching resource, which really shows very clearly how this um, theory of gender identity is based on essentialist brain theories, that you either have a pink brain or a blue brain, and those, can, those brains can end up in, in any any bodies. Next one. And this is just one of the ways. This is from a book called Introducing Teddy, and this is for early years children. And it shows one of the main messages that children are taught in these books, that I need to be myself. And if you look at all of the transgender books for children, you'll notice that Whereas books about gay and lesbian people tend to be older people or mummy, two mummies or two daddies, the transgender books are all about children transitioning or teddies or penguins, creatures without genitals. Um, and this is one of the key messages, that being transgender is being your true, authentic self. And once we call a child transgender rather than calling a child uh, factually a child with gender dysphoria, then we have to follow that with the, with the approach of affirmation, because otherwise we would be transphobic. So I want to point out that what schools are being asked to do is not to include transgender people um, like under the protected characteristic gender reassignment in the Equality Act and make sure that they are referring to that protected characteristic and ensuring that there is no discrimination against children who identify as transgender, which, was, which would be correct. What they are being asked to do is to take part in an experimental approach towards children, which is called affirmation and social transition. And affirmation is not a model which has been informed uh, or de and developed through clinical research, and there is no evidence to support its use in schools. Um, and yet schools are being instructed through guidance to implement this controversial approach whereby teachers must facilitate the full social transition of children and young people in their care to the extent that they must be referred to and treated as a member of the opposite sex in all circumstances, including in toilets, changing rooms, residential accommodation and sports. And I want to point out here that, ch that schools do not have an obligation to teach gender identity. Gender identity is not a protected characteristic. Gender is not a protected characteristic. So gender identity, uh, to change policies to be in line with gender identity is the distinction between boys and girls, rather than sex being the distinction between boys and girls, is not um, an obligation of schools. They must protect uh, children covered by the protected characteristic sex, and they must make a distinction between sex and gender, and notice that when facilities are divided on the basis of sex for the privacy and safety of all pupils, that has got nothing to do with gender. It has got nothing to do with gender stereotypes, and it's got nothing to do with people's internal feelings. And what's happening now in schools with the replacement of sex with gender identity is that in the name of inclusion, girls are being excluded from their own facilities and just as I'm not able to talk about the English EHRC schools guidance, I will have to refer to the Scottish leaked 
guidance, which I'm sure you've all seen, and that girls are forced to move out of their own facilities and use a gender neutral toilet to get changed in if they are embarrassed about getting changed in front of a male classmate. Now this policy uh, throughout school life I would call grooming. The policy of inclusion erases sexual boundaries and I would question any group that's going into schools advising schools that all facilities must be mixed sex and in fact to tell teenage girls that if they feel uncomfortable they must move to other facilities in front of everybody else in their class they are revealing to their classmates that they are a either a prude or b a bigot what girls have to risk in making that public um, uh, revelation is social exclusion and no teenage girl can risk social exclusion so this policy is an example of coercive control it's the kind of policy that we should be uh, warning girls against <clears throat> in their personal relationships and all children to recognize what coercive control is. So this is a massive... Um, so that's a massive safeguarding issue which takes away our, 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 our responsibility to protect girls and inform girls especially of um, their rights. Um, and it also takes away the principle of consent that girls are not asked whether they uh, or, or their consent is not sought. So any um, teaching about consent, if that uh, um, basic boundary, that se basic sexual boundary is breached as school policy, then there is no way that a school can also teach teenagers about the principle of consent. Um, so, looking at how we've called children transgender rather than gender dysphoric, for a gender dysphoric child, um, psychotherapeutic support structures may be developed with the aim of alleviating the dysphoria. However, for the transgender child as an emblem of a global political rights movement, the only acceptable approach is validation, reinforcement and consolidation of, of their transgender identity. And once we characterise a child as transgender, any other approach becomes transphobic. It would be denial of a child's identity, it would be trying to make a trans child cis, it would be conversion therapy. And the claim by activists that as affirmation is not a medical treatment, it is benign, shows a lack of understanding of the power of psychological intervention, especially in a very young child or a very vulnerable child, autistic children, for example, or those with other neurodevelopmental um, differences. And it's a disingenuous claim. Affirmation is only the first step on the path to full social transition, followed by puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. And the lobby groups who promote affirmation and social transition, such as mermaids and, and uh, gyres and uh, gendered intelligence, are the same organisations who campaign for earlier and earlier medical intervention for children. So Jaya's campaigns for cross-sex hormones to be available, quote, on an individual basis in accordance with reasonable readiness criteria excluding age. And admits that we have urged, urged the JIDs to adopt a triage method of assessing the urgency of individual cases and providing fast-track access to physical treatment when needed. The triage process could be conducted via telephone and email before the first appointment. Some clients should be seen in less than 18 weeks. That's Gires from 2016, and that's in their response to the NHS consultation on gender identity services. And Gires' suggestions for the wording of the NHS, those that enter the service at Tanner stages three and four will be fast-tracked to start hormone blockers, bearing in mind that their pubertal changes may be causing them great anxiety. And this idea that natural puberty is too difficult to bear. 
and that denying adolescents access to hormone blockers will cause them to want to take their own lives is consistently publicly promoted by the charity Mermaids especially. Stonewall are also very good at doing this. Susie Green said in an interview in The Guardian in 2015, medical intervention is very important, especially for teenagers who are already in puberty. It's absolutely vital. If they feel their body is changing against their will, as so many girls do, especially, um, that's when we get a lot of suicidality, self-harm, lots of young people talking about wanting to be dead. If you've got a child who's suicidal and self-harming because their body is changing against their will, nothing is done to fast-track or deal with that need. And Bernard Reed, who's the CEO of Gyres, warns of the dangers of not allowing young people to be themselves through preventing their natural puberty and suggests that withholding treatment may cause them to self-harm. He says, it can be demeaning and highly stressful for young people not to be themselves. Work suffers as a consequence and they may engage in self-harm. So what, what's the evidence for affirmation and social transition? Well, we know that, I mean, there was a, a study in 2013 by Dr. Thomas Steensma of the Dutch Clinic that showed that social trans, affirmation, social transition was the biggest predictor of persistence of gender dysphoria. Um, a, a paper by De Vries, also of the Dutch Clinic in 2012, warns of the danger that a young child is, who is unduly affirmed does not yet fully understand the concept of natal sex and says, another reason we recommend against early transitions is that some children who have done so barely realise that they are of the other natal sex. They develop a sense of reality so different from their physical reality that acceptance of the multiple and protracted, protracted treatments they will later need is made unnecessarily difficult. And DeVries also warns about the difficulty, having been socially transitioned, of tra transitioning back. And also Dr. Thomas Steensma at the Hot Topics in Child Health Conference in London in 2017 also warned of this difficulty and cited the case of a girl who took two years to transition back. She waited until she got to secondary school because it was so difficult. And we have to... You know, we have to question here, if social transition is difficult to come back from, there must be a question about how possible it is realistically for some children to change their minds at all when their mind has been influenced through affirmation by parents, teachers, other trusted adults and their peer group during critical developmental years. And we also know that puberty blockers have been shown. So once a child persists, they are more likely to go on to puberty blockers. And we know now that puberty blockers are also, um, it also um, persistence is, is correlated with the use of puberty blockers. That over 90%, sometimes 100% of children in different countries go on to cross-sex hormones after taking puberty blockers. And that that seems to be setting in stone the, the transgender identity of the child. And the, um, the Dutch clinic have begun to acknowledge that, that the blocker does not buy time. And this was in 2000, this year, in two EPATH presentations. They state that puberty suppression is meant to create thinking time. Nonetheless, most adolescents seem to experience their treatment with puberty suppression as the first step into the transitioning of their gender. And even though treatment with puberty blockers is described as an extended diagnostic phase, many transgender adolescents seem to experience puberty blockers as the first necessary medical step of a seemingly indisputable trajectory <coughs> with permanent physical changes through gender-affirming hormones and or surgeries in the end. If the treatment with, pu with puberty blockers is seen as the first step to take in gender-affirming treatment, very young children make a decision with lifelong consequences. And where are children learning this? You need to take puberty blockers essentially so that as an adult you will pass better 
as the opposite sex. And decisions are made. These, this is transgender doctrine. And these decisions are made on the basis that cosmetic appearance is more important than biological function. So children stand to lose their st sterility and their sexual function. But as long as they look good, that's all that matters. Now, who is, who is driving this? Is this, is this, an, a, is this a, a, an important issue for the parents and for transgender activists and possibly older activists who look back and think, that's what I would have wanted? Um, but children are being denied um, for sexual function in adulthood and at a stage where they cannot possibly understand the sacrifice that they are making. I think I've run out of time. Oh, sorry, I don't. <laughs> Mermaids. Um, have I run out of time? Ten couple minutes. Okay, and I just want to finish with, um, as this is being promoted in schools and teachers are really being forced to collude in an approach which is a very extreme approach dictated by political activists within schools, as Heather mentioned, um, and that actually the evidence for this affirmation and social transition approach just, just isn't there. We do not know if this is harmful. We are beginning to see emerging evidence that it may be, that it may be increasing persistence. Um, and we are also, I think, trusting, as I think you said again, Heather, that the NHS and the, and the, and the JIDs are are pursuing this out of evidence and research-based evidence and they're not there is no such thing as robust evidence in the transgender field of medicine and this is for the, the very simple reason that you cannot have randomized controlled um, trials and the reason for that is that there is no alternative pathway there is no psychotherapeutic non-invasive pathway offered as an alternative so we do not have an alternative pathway to compare and when the JIDs started their puberty blockers trial their early intervention study in 2010 they went through an ethical review process and the report on that process from the Health Research Authority has just come out a week or so back. It, it is very, very troubling that the JIDs, and I'll quote this, presented the use of puberty blockers as a, a way of buying time. And in fact, they had already decided that the cohort they were giving puberty blockers to were likely to progress to cross-sex hormones. So, when you think about a child being able to give consent, the JIDs were essentially mis-selling what they were offering children, that this is a chance to take your time to decide whether you want to progress on to future treatment. If the JIDs clinicians had already decided, well, that one's likely to, we'll give them puberty blockers, how much did that, even if it was not stated directly how much was that assumption of outcome um, how much did that influence the children who were taking puberty blockers and this what worries me about this is again policy capture and even in the health research authority report so much is taken so much of transgender doctrine is taken without questioning so, for example, did you know that puberty blockers, um, with, the, with the Tavistock trial, it was not a clinical trial of puberty blockers to see if they were safe. And the, the HRA report said they did not need to do a clinical trial because we know the effects of puberty blockers because they're used for precocious puberty. Well, that's transgender do uh, dogma. That's what you hear from trans, trans activists. The fact that puberty blockers have never before been used at the time of natural puberty, and we're now seeing clinical trials on sheep with really worrying results about irreversible effects on the brain. This seems to me like there, is no, there are no ethical checks and balances to this treatment, and that the, um, the doctrine and the propaganda from trans activists 
has been assimilated so deeply within the NHS and within the JIDs that we cannot even see past it, that this is not normal medical standards and medical practice. And schools need to know that, that there is no uh, robust evidence base to support the, the uh, affirmation and social transition of children in schools and the subsequent treatment with puberty blockers. Thank you. One. <laughs> Sorry, let's just <laughs> get round to mermaids. What's with number five? Hello, my name's Lynn Hahn. I'm from the Lesbian Rights Alliance. I'd just like to raise the issue of what's oh, yeah. I mean, the time Is that better? No, no, no. Right. Um, I am from the Lesbian Rights Alliance, and uh, Stephanie has actually got in her pack. Uh, a statement from us about what's happening to young lesbians in schools. And um, I'd just like to bring up the issues of, um, that we know are happening, um, what's happening at Tavistock, for example, because they've spoken out about it, that what they're doing is gay conversion therapy for many of the, um, the uh, patients, so-called patients who go there. Um, and what and how that relates to what's happening in schools because we've been contacted by a number of parents uh, over the last two years um, saying that their initially defined lesbian daughters who initially define themselves as lesbian are then um, sucked into um, transgender ideology <coughs> through transgender forums like mm. mermaids and so on to, to want to transition, um, and how, how can they combat this? So, well, we know what's happening in schools is that those who define as same-sex attracted are bullied at school, and bullying is actually a key factor which can turn them to want to um, change and to go into transition. Um, another factor is, of course, um, misogyny and um, widespread sexual abuse of girls and that often happens at the start of puberty and that also happens to um, girls who define as lesbian and lots of them do define as lesbian before they get to puberty in the sense that they know that they're saying sex attractive and say that they are. Um, so in terms of addressing this issue in schools we we really do have to um, try and get teachers to recognise this is a problem. This is a real problem, and the fact that for girls, um, compulsory femininity is now the order of the day. Girls can no longer define as tomboys, yeah. Yeah. for example. Mm. Um, they are pushed into um, defining as trans boys or men by um, compulsory femininity being forced on them in schools, or in a lot of schools. Um, so tackling sex-based stereotypes is, is really important as well, but rarely does this happen. I mean, I have a granddaughter who, if you look at um, some of the examples of um, a, a girl who would be possibly seen as a trans boy, she what she watches pro her favourite child TV program is SpongeBob, for example, and that's put down as a possible a child who might possibly be a boy in their terms. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you, want to, do you want to go? I'll come. I'll. Do you want some more questions first? Yes. Uh, everyone. I'm from uh, Sweden. I'm from the Scandinavian Network. Uh, and I'm hey. a member of uh, parents and uh, professionals and the practitioners. 
And I wrote our website uh, at the very end there on the paper. Um, and we're, we're, we're struggling with the same things as you are, and we just want to reach out so we can, yeah, we can do this together. Yay. Yay. Um, I just wanted to, um, Stephanie had talked about um, the level of institutional capture that is happening around this, and I just wanted to very quickly read two very short pieces that I think are really relevant, because this is so much bigger than we kind of talked about today. This is from a document called Free and Equal, which is a campaign by the United Nations. Everyone has the right to be recognised as a person before the law. The United Nations has affirmed the right of trans persons to legal recognition of their gender identity and a change of gender in official documents, including birth certificates, without being subjected to onerous and abusive requirements. It goes on to talk about how this right is violated in all regions and that trans children and adults are frequently branded as ill or pathologised based on their gender identity or expression. Being trans is part of the rich diversity of human nature, and being different should not be treated as a disorder. The United Nations has highlighted that the pathologization <coughs> is one of the root causes of human rights violations faced by trans people. And to complement that, there is also, sorry, this is a submission by mermaids to the LGBT healthcare, um, uh, I can't the word, the government did an inquiry recently. Um, mermaids have said, Mermaids asks that a thorough audit of all staff and their views on transgender issues, this is from Jids, um, and identities is carried out to ensure that every trans and non-binary child is dealt with in a respectful and supportive way. And that's slightly terrifying when it's up in its own. But they then go on to say no clinician should and can, as a matter of international principle and law, deny a child or young person right to their identity, and every child has the right to the best possible health as per the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Anne Joyce, I'm a journalist, so I probably know a lot of you in the room from the web. Um, I've written an article, for example, about some more Um, um, fantastic talk. I mean, the thing that, that comes across is about this policy capture, and as you said, it, it's happened. It happened in the Tavistock because, in so many ways, in this sort of experimental treatment with vulnerable kids, we're operating outside normal medical good practice in terms of research. Mm -hmm. In terms of the sort of um, you know, in terms of making sure that we're looking after kids in terms of protecting them and, and their futures, one thing other. And this was highlighted to me just before I resigned as governor when I asked the medical director uh, what the outcomes were because I used to be uh, in charge of the department at Tavistock. We had to do outcomes on everyone that we saw. The JID service is the only service that is not adhering to that um, request, which is extraordinary. They take no interest in what happens to the kids once they've been treated. Mm. I mean, it's quite bizarre, and and how the, the sort of corruption has got into the system mm. where this is actually permissible. Mm. Um, it's like they've been they sort of ruled themselves out. They play by different rules yeah. to the rest of the trust. Mm. Quite strange. Mm. Um, just very 
quick point. So the group of lawyers, sort of journalists just there that was asked about legal actions. So Sinclair's Law is the sort of overall um, group of uh, lawyers who are helping me with my case. But there's a chap called Paul Conrad who is uh, working pro bono with me on this case. He's an amazing um, man. And uh, he, obviously we're not, we're still liable for the cost, especially if we lose the case, which is why that crowd justice thing is so important. <laughs> to share, but um, he is definitely interested in taking more cases, and actually I did say to Trent, you know, that I think if they don't come back to you with this, and um, you send them that letter and say, and I hear from you within 14 days, I am taking legal action, and I think we have got to do this again and again, I, I agree with you, I think we've got to that idea. I will have to stop, Jan. We're, over, we're running over time already, so yeah, we, we can ha we can have a discussion afterwards when, when all the speakers are finished, as I said earlier. But I think we need to let Stephanie yeah. answer as, as far as she has <coughs> time to. Uh, she may not be able to answer a lot of questions, yeah. but we can have a larger discussion later on in the day. But we are running over at the moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so just very briefly, I think the, the transgender tra tra child is outside all the rules. Everything about transgender is outside society's normal rules. Uh, legal, yeah, we're on that. Um, we're doing stuff behind the scenes on that constantly, don't worry. Um, I think the, the issue about lesbians in schools, um, it's, it's really, really important that we, I mean, I think it's fantastic that the LGB Alliance has, has now sprung up. Um, I, I think, yeah, support, support for them. Um, and and that that will um, you know that's a huge public statement and the the power of Stonewall certainly they may still have financial power but, but certainly their sort of popular power uh, I think we're at a real turning point with Stonewall they're being recognised as a very you know conservative regressive misogynistic lesbophobic organisation I didn't talk it I'm sorry I didn't. There's so much to say in such a short time. I didn't talk about the scandal of aut autistic kids, the scandal that we're not even looking at why so many teenage girls are transitioning and so many lesbians. I don't want to miss out boys because I, I feel a bit bad that I don't... Actually, I think it, it, it is... You know, for boys, there's been an over a 1,000% increase in the last decade. That is massive. In any other circumstances, we'd be going, what's happening to boys? It's just completely overshadowed by the over 5,000 and percentage increase in girls but I want to say to parents of boys you know actually set, you know write to me give me a piece to publish I'm always looking for material on boys as well because I think they are a bit neglected and almost 100% 100% of parents who contact me with boys they're either gay or they are ASD OCD absolutely 100% so um, so let's not forget the boys <laughs> <laughs>